Looks like folks are still coming in. We're at 260. When it slows down just a bit, we'll go ahead and get started. I think we will get started. You know, all know how I like to get started on time. So good morning. Uh, welcome to spring 2022 convocation. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you. In the event we haven't met, I'm David Wayne Kuhn, and I have the pleasure to serve as uh, your president of the College of Marin. I just want to remind you all that the program is being recorded, and captioning is available via the link uh, that was just put in there um, by VTAC. That's who is providing that. And we're joined by uh, two very talented uh, ESL interpreters. Uh, Kat and Hannah, and I want to uh, give them a round of applause, uh, even though they, they couldn't hear it if we were doing it. So uh, give them a round of applause. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, hope that you had a tremendous uh, holiday break. I know that some of you are just returning, and so I hope that was all that you expected it would be, relaxing and rejuvenating and the like. Uh, and for those of us that have been back for a little bit, uh, thanks for uh, what you've been doing the past couple of weeks to get us stood up for the spring semester. Uh, it was uh, tremendously great to be with 118 of you in person uh, back in December when we had our annual holiday party for the first time together in a number of years. And we were able to have that party just before Omicron started to ugly, uh, rear its ugly head. Uh, we had a great holiday party. I want to thank everybody that was involved in planning of that. Uh, those of us that were there had a great time. And I'm pleased to report that nobody uh, uh, got sick, which is always what we're aiming for. So let's move to the next slide. I'm going to do some introductions and some acknowledgments. I'd first of all like to acknowledge our Board of Trustees. I know that there are several of them that have joined us today uh, for our program here at Convocation. Uh, they had a meeting just yesterday that were hard at work. And uh, one of the things that they approved yesterday was by area trustee maps. So that uh, just, just historically, you may know that our seven trustees are elected at large from across Marin County, regardless of where they live. And that little thing called the California Voters' Rights Act came around and suggested that we might want to do that differently. And so we've been working really hard to come up with trustee areas. So we have seven trustees and we will continue to have seven trustees, but beginning 2023, after the 2022 election, uh, they will be serving by areas. So um, just so you know that uh, uh, Trustee Brown will be in area one, uh, Trustee Cranenberg will be area two, uh, Trustee Trainer will be area three, area four is uh, Paul De Silva, area five is Eva Long, and area six is Stephanie O'Brien, and area seven is Diana Conti. We will have that map posted for you so you can see actually what that means. It basically means that uh, trustees, uh, whether it be these trustees or in the future other trustees will be elected by area. So we're, we're very excited about that. It's very interesting that the map that was selected uh, by the board was submitted by a young man by the name of Zach Griggy. And Zach was previously a um, Nevada Unified High School student. And while he was a high school student, he actually drew up the map that the Nevada Unified District ended up choosing. Uh, and now he's studying demography at UC Irvine, and he actually created the map, map number three, the Griggy map that the board adopted last evening. So it's kind of an interesting thing to have a student uh, to be involved in the process and ultimately to have their map chosen. So just a bit of information there for you knowing about our board. So I want to thank our board for their service and thank them for being here uh, today and supporting all of uh, our efforts. Let's move on to the introduction of new employees. We have a number of new employees and as is tradition, we introduce them and when we're together, we ask them to stand and we give a big shout out to them and, and make a big deal about welcoming them to our community. So we have two categories, we have brand new employees and then we also have employees that are new to their position but not new to the college and we take the opportunity to introduce all of those. So I'm gonna take the moment just to actually read these. We have uh, Sarah Andereg and she is the Executive Assistant One in Student Learning and Success, supporting uh, Vice President Eldridge. We have Matthew Christian, Christman, excuse me. He's an ESA Two in Enrollment Services. We have Kelly Gaffney, not new to the college, but new to her position, Accounting Specialist, Fiscal Services. Congratulations, uh, Kelly. 
We have Alexander Hakamo, excuse me, uh, administrative assistant to at Allied Health. I apologize there, Alexander, for mispronouncing your name. Welcome to Alexander. We have Alex Jones, Alexander Jones, uh, again, not new to the college, but new to the position. He is now the full-time work experience instructor uh, supporting counseling. So congratulations, Alex. We have Christine Leung, who was previously a part-time court reporting instructor, and now she is the full-time court reporting instructor. So congratulations, Christine. We have Tessa uh, Logering, who has um, moved to a new position at the college, uh, administrative assistant three, community ed and uh, services. And so uh, Tessa, congratulations on your move. Uh, we welcome uh, Aaron McBride Africa, drama instructor at Performing Arts. We have uh, Lauren Service, who is Dean of Arts and Humanities. And we have Jeff Yates, who is, uh, again, was part-time teaching in computer science and now is the full-time computer science instructor. So congratulations, Jeff. So let's take a moment and give all that group a big round of applause and welcome to the college. And we have more yet. Uh, we have a number of new part-time employees and the vast majority, I believe these are part-time faculty. And I always say when we're together, uh, regardless of the, the uh, modality, is that we couldn't do what we do without our important part-time faculty because they just, we have so many and they're so important to the work we do. We just couldn't serve all the students that we have without them. So we have very quickly, we have Darlene Abbott Brady in nursing. We have Michelle Alines in the library. We have Victor Coronado in human communication. We have Jeffrey Glazier in fire technology and EMT. We have Kimberly Jupe in nursing. We have Ariel Katz in computer science. We have Jeanette Molinet, Molineux in early childhood education. We have uh, Tabo Mikasa Kelly in nursing, and I apologize there too. I should have done a better run through on my names this time. Moving on to the next group, we have uh, Sean Negus in English, Sarah Norton in administration of justice, Ivan Ornelas in human communication, Ron Oxford in the library, Laura Richard in art history, Grace Sobieski uh, in early childhood education, Samantha Wilson in nursing, and Bertie Winrow in early childhood education. So let's provide all of our new employees a warm welcome to the College of Marin. And my challenge to all of you, as you know, is to reach out to these new folks, make a coffee date. I think you should make it after February 7th, get together with them and make sure that they feel welcome to the College of Marin. So thank you very much. Let's now move to uh, our, just a quick peek at our agenda. We have college updates and really our update today relates to spring opening. We're gonna, I know that's what's on everybody's mind. So we're gonna keep focused on that particular item. And then we have an amazing keynote address for you uh, by Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade. And we'll have an appropriate uh, introduction of him and we'll uh, be able to tell you more about him before he speaks. So with that, we can move to the next slide. I want to move to my update to you on what's on everybody's mind, which is the start of spring semester. So where have we been? And I'm not gonna go back to March, 2020. I can assure you, because I'm sure that would make us all go crazy. -er. And so I just wanna go back to actually uh, January 6th. And it was at that time on January 6th that I had communicated to you regarding uh, the first communication of the new year regarding the spring semester. We all know that Flex Week starts, started on Tuesday after the holiday and the Martin Luther King holiday. And I hope you all found a, an appropriate way to celebrate and honor Dr. King for his legacy of service and, and leadership. Um, so we started Flex Week uh, Tuesday and we are scheduled to start instruction uh, this coming Monday, the 24th. And on January 6th was when I uh, basically made the announcement to you that we would be continuing to start those things, but we would actually do this remotely for the uh, first week, and then we would move to the second week uh, of in-person instruction beginning, I believe it was uh, January 29th. And you know, I provided you a rationale for doing that. Obviously, it's all about Omicron at this point. We're doing everything we can to continue to uh, keep you safe and our uh, students safe as well. And so as I committed to in that January 6th communication, we would keep our eye on the ball and continue to be data informed about the decisions we're making relative to spring semester. I also committed to you to communicate no later than January 18th about the next update or if there was anything new information that we had. And so hopefully you've all had the opportunity to uh, open your email and you've had the opportunity to read that email. 
Uh, but I'm going to basically cover where we're at at this particular time for spring, the latest and greatest information that we have relative to spring opening. We're going to continue to, classes will begin on Monday, and some, there's actually some Saturday starts as well, so I don't want to leave them out because they're important. The classes will start next week as planned. And I have to say that every day we're picking up enrollment, and which is really exciting um, to see. And I look forward to having Holly's report come out later today and see where the numbers are at. But we're making good progress. We've closed the gap there for a while. Our gap was much larger than it is now. We're only down about 5% of where we want to be, where we need to be over last year. And so the gap is closing. So that's exciting. Our students are coming back. Um, so made the announcement yesterday after, first of all, let me back up. Last Friday, I had a special meeting of the over, oversight committee, our COVID oversight team, which is comprised of the leadership of, of faculty, leadership of, of our staff, other important members of the, the college that are have an involvement in keeping all of us safe and making the right decisions in this regard. After consulting with them and looking at the data, not only the data for Marin County, because you know, although 88% of our students ish, 87, 88, depending on the year, uh, live in Marin, uh, you know, the majority of you do not. Over 60% of you actually live in other counties and, and commute in. So it didn't make sense to just look at Marin County in making our decision. It made sense to look at Sonoma County, what was going on there, Contra Costa County, which is that's where the bulk of our employees come from that, that commute in. So based on looking at the, the positivity rate in those counties and in looking at what the, the county was saying relative to when we might plateau and then cases might actually start coming down, we felt it was prudent at that time um, to actually extend the remote instruction one more week, right? So not starting on the 29th as planned, but kicking it down to the, to the, the 7th. Uh, and so that was the decision that was made. And impartially in doing that, um, we were acknowledging that, and I included all of the things that we have done uh, district-wide to ensure the safety of, of our employees and our, our students. And I, I have to say, I, I hope you agree that it's an impressive list because I can't imagine too much more that could go on this list that we aren't already doing. Um, so I wanna thank everybody that's involved in that. But by February 7th, as I indicated in my memo, we'll also be receiving 60,000 uh, N95 masks. That will give us the ability to not only give all of the employees an N95 mask, but also to distribute them to students as well. So that's an extra step of safety precaution that we're taking there. And the other factor we considered is that by February 7th, we would be fully set up with our um, ongoing testing services that we'll be offering to students and employees on campus. And um, I, those services here, uh, the Kentfield campus will be Mondays and Thursdays will be available. And Vice President Nelson, remind me what date they'll be at um, the Indian Valley campus. They'll start the same day at both campuses. Okay, great, terrific. Okay, so we'll have testing on both campuses on both of those days, which is really exciting. So that was the decision that was made. Um, again, I've listed everything that we have done and continuing to do to ensure the safety of our, our employees and our students. Uh, but the plan at this particular time is to come back on February 7th in person. Now, that's a couple weeks away. We're going to continue to do what we've always done throughout this process, and that's to keep our eye on the ball and look at the data. And if something changes, I'll rally the group again, and we will, we will adjust if we have to. I am hopeful, very hopeful, cautiously optimistic that we're not going to have to do that. I know there are mixed feelings about coming back. I think some folks would not like to come back. Uh, and there are some folks that are very eager to come back. And so I respect both of those points of view. Um, and I, you know, I acknowledge that this is very stressful. It's been very stressful. There's a lot of anxiety, not only for you and your families, but certainly for our students and their families. And so we wanna do what's right, but we wanna do it in the right way at the right time. And that's been our focus. So before I move on from that, I'd like to ask uh, Vice President Eldridge, uh, he had some comments he wanted to share relative to some instruction, student services. Um, and so Jonathan, if you take it at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, welcome back uh, everyone. Uh, hopefully everyone had a chance to get some good downtime over the break. Um, yesterday uh, at the department chairs and coordinators meeting, I asked everyone uh, to share um, one word that represent, represented their feeling going into the semester. And uh, you know, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but the, the majority of, of uh, responses had to do with being hopeful, being ready, uh, being excited, 
to get going. And I think, um, you know, years ago, um, I had a, a former supervisor who said, you know, the cards you're dealt are determinism, but how you play them is free will. And I'm, I'm thinking that for the last 20, almost three months, um, we're looking at the hand that we've been dealt saying, you know, why, why us? Uh, but on the other hand, we have an opportunity here as we head into this spring uh, to find a way over the next few weeks to um, have a, a great uh, uh, welcome for our students, uh, many of whom have never been on campus before because they joined us during the pandemic. Um, and so these first two weeks give an opportunity to get to know them and to uh, answer their questions, get them going with their studies, and then we'll get them back onto campus. Just a few notes. Um, for all the faculty, I've sent out a couple of times a frequently asked questions uh, attachment to some emails. I'm going to send that out again today, um, along with a few other updates. Uh, but certainly, uh, we want to make sure that every faculty member has certain language in their syllabus, and that language is provided for you. We want to make sure that every faculty member uh, is communicating uh, through Canvas and email with the students enrolled in your classes, and those enrollments are growing day by day. Uh, making sure they understand that the first uh, class session will be remote, make sure that they have the, the Zoom link for that, um, and that uh, uh, you, when you meet with them, you'll also be letting them know that we are going two weeks uh, remote before uh, coming back in person, with a few limited exceptions, and I think everyone knows who needs to know uh, what those are knows that. Uh, we will be communicating directly with students, and we have been, but I think um, obviously faculty pay or students pay way more attention to their faculty. Uh, and so as you communicate with uh, your course rosters, um, please be clear in that communication as to those expectations. That said, we will be having staff stationed around campus beginning on Monday, um, just in case we have a few students show up uh, wondering uh, where everyone is. Um, we'll have some uh, computer lab spaces made available as well so that any student who comes to campus and then panics that they're supposed to be in class, we can get them to a computer lab and get them logged on um, so that they don't miss uh, any instruction. Um, we will continue to have folks station around with the uh, ask me buttons um, throughout the first couple of weeks. Uh, and then particularly uh, as of uh, the 7th of February, we'll ramp that up significantly so we can help people find their way around campus. And student services will be ramping back up um, all of our services now um, do have some in-person services, and those will be increasing as we get toward February 7th. But I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone uh, for figuring out uh, your own way through all of this um, and staying true to what our mission is, which is providing equitable opportunities and fostering success for all members of our diverse community. Um, and that has been incredibly difficult, uh, but I would also say um, having reviewed a number of uh, faculty evaluations uh, and staff evaluations over the last uh, few weeks uh, from the fall, there's some really innovative stuff happening. Uh, and some of that stuff, I think, came about because we were put in this difficult position. So out of that, I think we've, uh, we've all learned uh, and we've all stretched uh, the way in which we think about the work we do. And as difficult as that is, um, I'm just really proud to be part of a community where everyone is so focused on helping our students uh, find success uh, as we move forward. Um, so look for another, faculty can look for another email from me later today. Uh, and uh, uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to President Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Eldridge. Uh, if we can spotlight Vice President Nelson as well. I see there's some, some uh, questions that are being asked in the chat. I see they're being answered, but I think it would be good if we actually verbally answered those as well. Uh, there was a mention about fees. I, I hope you all know that we're actually paying the students' fees this spring. It's pretty amazing, right? We're paying their tuition, we're paying their, their lab fees, we're paying their um, all the fees, all the fees. Parking even is free this semester. Um, so if we can leave, leave Vice President Eldridge in also, and then if, if somebody could read me the questions, I'll toss it, either answer it, I'll toss it to one of these guys to answer. Thank you. So who wants to read me the question? Is that you, Jesse? Um, yes, here we go. So there was a question, uh, I think you just answered about parking and this is the next question. Will the staff that is there to help on campus during the first week be available to evening students as well? Uh, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, we will have at least a couple of folks around um, after five o'clock, just in case we have some evening students show up um, looking for a class. Yes. Great. 
Thank you. Next question. Will there be signage in the lots, uh, re free parking? Greg. Uh, yes, campus police is currently working on signage for the individual parking lots uh, so that students will know. And we've also communicated that with uh, students as well. Thank you. Next. Next one. Uh, what time will testing be available on those days? Uh, Greg. Uh, I've done the details, all the logistical details regarding testing will come out in the following week. We just signed the agreement last Friday. Terrific. Thank you. More to come. Next question. Will outdoor sports, um, let's see, <clears throat> will outdoor sports and fitness classes take place during the first two weeks? Jonathan. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we do have a few select classes that will be uh, in person during the first couple of weeks. We've got, I think, a couple of sections of some art classes that will be going outdoors to do their, um, uh, their studio work. Um, and then uh, the athletic department, kinesiology and athletics, um, is, is arranging for which of the, um, the uh, fitness classes and intercollegiate sports and others will be participating. But uh, many of them will be. Um, at, and perhaps not for the full two weeks. They may be meeting original or initially online um, to get set up and to talk through safety protocols and then coming back early. Uh, but that um, some of those will be, uh, most of those will be face-to-face. Uh, -face. We also have a few community education courses. We have some hiking, I think fly fishing, a few others that will be happening uh, as well um, during the first two weeks. Terrific. Uh, next question. When will the campus nurse be available? Jonathan. Uh, the Student Health Center uh, is scheduled to be open, I believe, Monday through Thursday. Um, the hours are still being finalized. I know this last semester it was nine to noon. Um, at least those hours, if not some more, will be added in. Um, we're yet fi to finalize those, but we'll, we'll get those posted. Um, I believe that they may be updated on the uh, uh, Health Center webpage. Uh, I don't have them in front of me, though. Terrific. Thank you. I, I see a number of questions popping in regarding testing itself relative to the new service as well as the health center. So why don't we wait to address those in a communication? Like as Greg mentioned, the details are being worked out on testing as far as times. And so we'll put together some a message that just relates to testing and answer all those questions. And that'll be forthcoming. Uh, there are other questions that don't relate to, to uh, testing. Uh, I see none at this moment. Okay. Terrific. I just wanted to mention that, it, so obviously we talked about cl how classes would be impacted between now and uh, February 7th, as it relates to staff, because obviously there's a lot of other people that work on campus than, than just you know in faculty, right? So we're continue to uh, work with our staff to stagger their schedules as we have been doing since July. Uh, and that will be worked out in, by individual departments, by individual supervisors to ensure we've got adequate coverage, uh, but at the same time, people not on top of each other and, and kind of splitting schedules throughout the week. So we recognize staff and I want to appreciate the staff for for their being here and continuing to keep us moving on right we've got some staff that have been here since almost the beginning so appreciate them so with that it seems like a thank you Vice President Nelson Eldridge um, I think it seems to be a perfect transition to our guest speaker and uh, if we have if we have time at the end after he's done his Q&A uh, we may come back to some additional questions as well so here to introduce our guest speaker I'd like to hand this off to T Perales and asked T to uh, tee us up, so to speak. I didn't mean it that way, but there you go, so. <laughs> That's awesome, thank you, Dr. Kuhn. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Teresa Perales. I'm the Equity and Activities Coordinator for the Office of Student Activities and Advocacy, as well as the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Action Committee Chair. Moving forward together, that is the theme of our spring 2022 flex. And moving forward together requires all of our intentional, proactive and ongoing commitment and practice of anti-racism and equity inside and outside of the classroom. To not only understand the definitions of these terms, but to embody the practice and the accountability of the transformation of each and every one of us so that we can transform ourselves our communities, and our campus and classrooms. How will we implement this across all of our disciplines, departments, teachings, and everyday practices so that we are truly co-creating a culture of equity, hope, and success? 
Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade is going to share with us his wisdom today. Sorry, one moment, my notes flashed away. Thank you for the for your patience. I'm very excited to introduce to you Dr. Duncan, um, Jeff Duncan Andrade today, who's gonna share his wisdom with us today as we continue on our movement of equity. Jeff Duncan Andrade is a professor of Latina, Latino, Latinx and race studies and resistance at San Francisco State University. He is also a founder of the Roses and Concrete Community School, a community responsive lab school in East Oakland and the Community Responsive Education Group. As a classroom teacher and school leader in East Oakland for the past 29 years, his pedagogy has been widely studied and acclaimed for producing uncommon levels of social and academic success for students. Duncan Andrade lectures around the world and has authored numerous journal articles and book chapters on effective practices in schools. He has written two books, and his third book with Harvard Press is due out spring 2021. So it should be out. In 2015, Duncan Andrade was tapped to be a commissioner on the National Commission on Teaching and America's Futures. And in 2016, he was part of the great educators invited to the White House on National Teacher Appreciation Day by President Obama. He is also the 2019 laureate for the prestigious Block International Prize in Education. Duncan Andrade is also consistently ranked as one of the nation's most influential scholars by Ed Week's public influence rankings. Dr. Andrade's transformational work on the elements of effective teaching in schools is recognized throughout the US as, and as far abroad as New Zealand. His research interests and publications span the areas of youth wellness, trauma responsiveness, curriculum change, teacher development and retention, critical pedagogy, and cultural and ethnic studies. He works closely with teachers, school site leaders, union leaders, and school district officials to help them develop classroom practices and school cultures that foster self-confidence, esteem, and academic success among all students. Duncan Andrade holds a PhD in social and cultural studies and education and a Bachelor of Arts degrees in literature, both from the University of California, Berkeley. It is my honor to welcome you, um, Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade to the College of Marin. Pass it on over to you. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. This uh, feels a little bit like a long time coming because we've been talking about trying to make this happen for for a while now, and I was really looking forward to actually being in in the same space with folks. Um, but here we are, uh, back on Zoom, um, and I, I just want to. I guess I want to acknowledge a couple of things before um, we jump into the questions that um, that you all sent. And the first thing I want to acknowledge is just, and I remarked on this when I saw the questions, just, I don't know, like I, I, I've done this um, approach to keynotes now for quite a while since we've, um, uh, a lot of this stuff started happening on Zoom. And I just found the questions that you all submitted to be, uh, frankly, the most thoughtful and um, serious <laughs> questions that um, that I've seen since I've started doing. And I felt really humbled um, and respected by uh, the questions that you all submitted. And so um, I just want to extend uh, gratitude for um, those of you that took the time to really take a look at some of the work that we've been doing around these um, uh, challenging times and what it means to actually uh, center wellness and center um, the most vulnerable and the most wounded uh, among us in our community. And um, I just 
found that the, the questions were um, deep and thoughtful. And, and then when, you know, just being in this space today and listening to how all of this uh, is being set up for you all to start the school year and, 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 you know, looking at the questions that people are asking again, I just, I, I, I don't know. There's, there seems to be something special going on in your community um, that as an outsider um, spending a little bit of time and looking in uh, makes me feel really hopeful for um, the students that uh, that you're going to be working with and for the community that you all are um, continuing to build. And I, I just also want to remark on how impressive it is for me, you know, sitting on the outside to see um, all of the complexity that uh, that folks are juggling and 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 wrestling with uh, to try and make um, school spaces work for students, and and in, in such an unstable and shifting uh, environment, it's really beautiful to be to count myself uh, among educators during a time when um, so much of the responsibility has fallen on, on us uh, to keep at least some sense of normalcy going on in so many students' lives. And, you know, history will, will write glowingly about how educators uh, adapted and shifted and adjusted during this time. And, um, and I'm honored to be able to be a part of a conversation with you all to keep exploring and pushing ourselves uh, to understand how we do that better and how we um, show up for the young people and the, and the students that, that need us the most um, and also how we do that for each other. So that's really uh, what I'm hoping that we can spend time talking about today. Um, I'll, you know, I try to be as um, direct and, and pragmatic as I can in, in answering the questions that you all submitted. Um, and I'll also try and provide uh, resources and connections where I, where I think that um, they might be useful for some of the things that you all are wrestling with in your community. So uh, I'll stop there. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say, uh, before we jump into your questions is um, that I, I just wanna uh, acknowledge my own um, uh, ancestral traditions before um, we start getting into the palabra. So um, I come from the Opata people, which connects me to Mexicayo and Mayan traditions. Um, and, and in our traditions, uh, we believe that it's important that you ask for permission to share palabra with, um, with a group of people, to share the word with a group of people. Um, and so I just, before we jump into uh, me responding to your questions, I just um, wanna acknowledge my ancestors, um, acknowledge my elders um, and ask for their permission uh, to spend a little bit of time with you all today and reflecting on, on your wonderings um, and the, the um, sort of guidepost around that, the, the, the cultural paradigm uh, that, that guides that asking and that permission um, is one that uh, is, is situated in, in what uh, many indigenous cultures refer to as the seven generations principle. Um, and, um, you know, the seven generations principle you will find uh, in, in many indigenous, uh, some iteration of it, some version of it in, in many indigenous communities around the world. Um, and so I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, the one that my elders have taught me. Um, and it's, I, I just wanna be clear that it, this is not the seven generations principle. This is just the one that, that I've been taught. Um, so uh, our belief is, is that anything that you do in any given moment is an echoing forward of the best of seven generations of your ancestors. And, and that's how powerful you are. That's how sacred you are. That's how important you are. That um, in, in any given moment, in any given interaction, um, you have that well, that depth uh, to be able to draw on 
um, the most beautiful learnings and teachings from seven generations back, seven generations back of, of, of your ancestors. And we also believe that the seven generation principles echoes in both directions. So anything that you do in any given moment um, will echo forward for seven generations. And that's how much power you have. That's how significant you are that in any given moment, um, your relationship with somebody, you know, and I, I would think particularly with students as educators, um, that what happens in that moment is not fleeting, that it will echo forward for seven generations. And so um, I just remind us that uh, to, to keep track of that, particularly in these times when we are so stressed and you know things rarely go to plan and they often come upside down and sideways at us. And, and if we can um, tap back into that teaching, um, I, I think that it, for me, it's one, uh, created a space where I'm more conscious about uh, both granting myself grace and uh, granting those that I'm interacting with grace. And um, and I think that, that that is particularly important in these times, that we are gracious with ourselves and patient with ourselves, and that we extend that same courtesy to those that we interact and engage with. And I think if, if we do that, um, we model for students what it means for us to show up in a way uh, that is uh, profoundly human and um, profoundly medicinal in a time when there is uh, so much hurting and so much sickness and so much suffering, um, it may be more important than ever that we uh, find the, the, the graciousness button and keep our thumb on it for uh, as often and as long as we can. So with, with that um, and, and the gratitude for uh, being invited into this space to share with you all today. Um, I'll just uh, turn it over to whoever, I think it's going to be David, um, is going to be facilitating some, some conversation with us, um, an opportunity to respond to some of your amazing questions. So thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to this um, dialogue. Terrific. Thank you. And I appreciate being called David. Okay to call you Jeff in this process? Terrific. Thank you. Well, Jeff, I wanted to express our appreciation for you being here. And it has been at least six months ago since we started talking about bringing you here. And, and so we're really grateful that you're here today. Um, and I also want to acknowledge those folks that have, have submitted some questions. It, and, and he's right. These questions are, are really amazing, really thoughtful. And um, I, hope we, we, I hope this sets the bar for the questions that we have for our future uh, guest speakers as well. So uh, you've seen the questions, Jeff, but for the benefit of our 374 participants that are here, I'll read them to you. I may uh, paraphrase a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to stay out of your way and just basically ask the questions and then we'll keep us moving because hopefully we can get to as many of these questions as we can. So with that, um, obviously, we heard your introduction, but is there more about your background, your work, and, and particularly your motivation about doing the important work that you do that you want to share with us today? Um, I mean, I, I guess I feel like you know, one of my uh, colleagues whose name is um, Patrick Kamanyan, he's a um, professor at the University of San Francisco, whose work I use a lot in my own teaching um, and, and whose work I, I would recommend that folks um, take a look at. You know, he said to me once, he said, um, I wanted to become the teacher that I never had. And that's one of the best um, articulations of, you know, it's like one of those times when you hear somebody say something and you wish you'd said it, you know, it's like that is so spot on for what what drives me. Um, and, um, and so I think from from the very beginning, I mean, I started teaching full time in, in Oakland when I was 20. And I couldn't even buy a drink legally, which was hard. <laughs> uh, and um, 
And I, th that has always kind of sat underneath my thinking, my reflection, that my um, desire to continue to grow is, is that um, wanting to be the teacher that I never had and, and knowing that, um, you know, I, I think that one of the mistakes that we make and, and, and have made historically in this field um, is an effort to uh, sanitize the classroom and sanitize the educational space. And I, I believe, and both as a practitioner um, and as a, a researcher and as a, a teacher of teachers that the meaning is in the mess. And that if, if you duck, dodge, deny the messiness that is teaching by virtue of the fact that it is, it's a human endeavor, right? It's a complex system, no matter how much we might try and scope it and control it and shape it. And it's, it's still at the end of the day, a set of human beings interacting with each other over a set of complex ideas. And so that's always gonna be messy at times. And then when you work in the fact that in the environments in which I teach, the environments in which you all are working, that, we, that we're often dealing with supporting, uh, 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 teaching, connecting with some of the most vulnerable and wounded populations in our society. And so, of course, that woundedness is going to show up in messy ways sometimes. And I think when we, when we want that to go away, when we wish it would go away, when we wish it would just all go to plan, I, I think we disrespect um, what it means to really be teaching. Because to, to me, what, what I've always felt was that when students showed up with the mess, with, when they showed up with the woundedness and they were willing to show that to me, that was a gift. That, that to me was like humbling that they would trust me enough to show up sideways, you know, that they, they didn't put on the front anymore, right? And if I wanted it to be convenient, then it wouldn't really be them honestly showing up with their woundedness. And that is, I, I get it, like that's hard and I've, I'm imperfect around it for sure. But when I am able to really reflect on who I want to be as a teacher and the kind of teachers that I want to support and develop. Um, I, I think about the teacher who um, welcomes the mess and who can find the courage, character, and commitment to stand in for students when they need us the most. That, that's sort of like how I measure, I guess, my value or my my. my my impact as an educator is, is not with the ones who, you know, come in shining and leave shining, right? And, and, and of course, like those students are just as important as, you know, any other student. But I, I really do try to think about measuring my, my impact based on the students that, um, that really talk about having an experience that was transformational for them in a time when they were really struggling in their life. And I, I always wanna be known as a teacher that, that found a way to, to show up consistently for those students and for them to know that no matter what's going on in their life, that there's a touch point, there's a place where they can go and be seen, heard and loved and even when they deserve it the least. You know, to my mom, who's not, today's my mom's birthday. So she, she's 93 today. Um, birthday mom. Yeah, and, and when my father uh, was, when my father died and I went to see my mom and, and I, was, I was in their bedroom and I saw this little thing. It was like a, a, a little framed, like note that my dad had given my mom and it said thank you for loving me when i least deserved it and and i thought about that not just as a teacher but as a person that 
the people that I'm probably closest with um, are the people who loved me when I least deserved it. Like that's how I knew, right? That they, that they genuinely loved me in the way that, you know, Tupac Shakur talked about unconditional love. And when you think like I'm a lit major, I'm a writer. And when you think about that, that that's kind of deep that to modify the word love, you know, like it's just, why isn't love enough? Cause sometimes, right. There's a, there's times when you don't deserve love, like your behavior, right. It's just like, who, who's going to love me in those moments. And I think that really sort of sorts folks out in your life, right. The people who love you unconditionally, and it doesn't mean they give you a pass, you know, it's like, if you're, disrespectful or dishonest or whatever like you still get called to the carpet but you never get the sense that they don't love you in fact you get the sense that they're holding you to this higher standard because they love you so much that they see you for who you really are and they know like you're outside yourself right now right but in that moment they're not chastising you or tearing you down or right. The accountability comes after the love, right? And, and there's an acknowledgement that right now, you don't need me to hold you accountable, right? Right now, what you need is a hug. Right now is what you need is me to lean into you and listen and tell you I'm going to show up, right? And then when we get through the, right, the, the fog, when we get through the mess, right, then we can talk about, you know, how, how that felt right? And, 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 and you owning it. But I've always tried to think about that as the essence of what it means to, for me to be a great teacher. And then, and then I build curriculum around that, right? Then I build pedagogy around that. Then I build classroom, whatever, climate, rules, culture around that. But that's always the place that I try to come back to. I, I don't try to do it the other way around. Fantastic. I know your message has resonated with a lot of our participants here today. Thank you for that response. Okay, uh, what strategies can you advise comm faculty to use in understanding the concrete of our students' experiences? And how might greater knowledge of our communities influence the classroom experience for students and their college experience in general? Well, so yeah, for, for those of you that um, you know didn't get a chance to, to uh, read all the stuff that got sent out or read the, the particular article that's being referenced there. I, I wrote an article several years ago for um, the Harvard Ed Review that, um, that uh, used the, the, the metaphor that um, uh, Tupac Shakur used to describe um, young people growing up in poverty as the roses that grow from concrete. And, and I, 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 that metaphor for me is, is really profound, powerful, and insightful. Um, because if, if you think about um, our students as um, seeds, and you know, in, in, in the case of this metaphor, like as, as a rose, and, um, and you think about the, the, the most vulnerable ones, they're effectively attempting to grow in concrete, and um, which is an you know almost impossible task. And, and yet, if you if you go outside and, and and you look down at the concrete, you will see life right finding its way through the concrete. And what it's, you know, Tupac um, uh, wrote a book of poetry. That, that is titled The Rose That Grew From Concrete. And, and that is also the probably the best known um, poem in the book. And, um, and one of the things that he says in the poem is he says, if, when you see a rose growing in the concrete, you don't question its damaged petals. Instead, you celebrate its tenacity and its will to reach the sun. And what I see happening a lot in schools, and this goes back to the meaning in the mess, right? Is that, um, that we, we, we've got these young people that are, that are, and not always, I mean, you're in a community college, so you don't always have young people, right? You, you've got students, right? That are, that are coming to us, um, coming into the educational space, having had to fight through concrete just, just to get there, 
right? So of course they have damaged pedals. And it's a choice that we make as educators about what we see first. And if you see the damaged pedals first, then, you, then you're taking a deficit model approach, right? You're looking at, well, why isn't this rose a perfect rose? As opposed to, which is fairly absurd when you think about it, if you recognize like, damn, that rose just grew through concrete. And the first thing I'm noticing is it's damaged petals. Why am I not noticing its tenacity and its will to reach the sun? And why, if I'm a gardener, extending the metaphor, right? No master gardener blames the seed for not growing. The master gardener acknowledges that if the seed doesn't grow, that I didn't create the right conditions for growth. And when you think about concrete, it's perhaps the worst possible environment in which something can attempt to grow, right? It's devoid of light, it's devoid of key nutrients. And on top of all that, it's toxic, like the chemicals in the concrete toxify. And yet, right, the rose finds its way up. And then it really is about what does the gardener do at that point? Does, does the gardener cultivate and, and care for the rose and see its damaged petals as evidence of its strength, right? Or does the gardener say, well, sh that'll never be a perfect rose. That's not how I imagine the rose in my garden would look, right? And so we, we then treat the rose like a weed, right? And we try to root it out. And that is, that is an educator choice. And that choice that we make as educators has a massive impact on students. And, and students, especially the rose, that grows from concrete knows very quickly based on our affect, right? It doesn't even need to be something we say. They know what we think about them. And if they don't believe that we can really see their tenacity and their will to reach the sun, they won't learn from us. Because one of the things that we know about trauma we know about toxic stress. We know about woundedness in the human population is that the, when you are in those moments, and this goes for all of us, right? When you're in those moments, the, those, those wounded moments, you don't let people in your head, right? That, that is the, that's your safe place, right? That's, you're, you're locking everybody out of there right now. And so with, with the wounded ones, what I often say is you win the heart to win the head. That you have to do the heart work, leave the head alone. Because if you keep banging on their head, right? And their heart is wounded, you're not getting in, right? And, and all you're doing is contributing to the woundedness. But if, if you can see their humanity, if you can see their tenacity and their will to reach the sun, then you know that, okay, my responsibility right now is to pour medicine on your heart and to do the heart work, which is code for relationships. Like just work the relationship, work the relationship, work the relationship, and eventually they will let you in their head, but you can't force your way in. And I think any great educator knows that, that there has to be an openness and a willingness on the part of the student to take the risk that is allowing someone in your head. And I think that, that sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, right? Sometimes there's a presumed alliance that I think we need to do a better job of questioning as educators, right? The presumption that every student shows up trusting us by virtue of the fact that we're their teacher. And I think so many students, particularly at community colleges and particularly in the, the, the schools where I work, there are so many students who have had so many negative experiences in schools that, that they show up and their default is to not trust. And it's not about you, like you gotta let the ego go. It's really not. It's about a historical set of relationships for that student and often that student's family and their ancestors between themselves, their people, their community and institutions of power and those who sit in institutions of power. And we don't always feel particularly powerful as teachers. <laughs> I get that, 
right? But we are, we are. And, and if you know that, then you know how to recognize, right? Those students that are showing up and needing a different kind of pedagogy and a different kind of curriculum. And the funny thing is that in our profession, we've known this for 40 plus years in the research. And in, in the research, we referred to it as differentiated instruction, right? And that's all I'm talking about here. But I think when we have talked about professionally about differentiated instruction, what we've mostly focused on is the head. We've mostly focused on like, well, how do I teach this reading strategy, right? Differently, better, right? This physics strategy differently or better. And that presumes an alliance that I think we've got to question. It presumes that the student is coming and is open to us being in their head, right? And with the students that are quote unquote not getting it, right? What I, what I find is that where I really need to differentiate my instruction is around my relationship with them. And, and that I just I'll get almost myopic around it. Right. And, and, and cause I know that once they trust that I trust them and that I really see them for all of their humanity, then they start giving me indicators that they're ready to now take the other lesson. Right. And to me, long game, if I think about it, like who do I, I'm on my deathbed. Who do I really want to be known as? Do I want to be known as the person who like always got the curriculum right? Or do I want to be known as the person who students always felt that this dude always saw me? And what was at the end of the day, what was most important to Jeff as a teacher with me was my well being. And he would wait to do the other stuff, which is very important to me. <laughs> like I want students to learn what I'm teaching, but it's much more important to me that they leave my, my class and my presence and our time together feeling well. Terrific. You know, you're a student of education. I'm a student of leadership. And I see a lot of parallels from, you know, teaching to the heart, from the heart, and leading from the heart to the heart. I think there's a lot of parallels there. And I know that, uh, Amazon has probably just run out of Tupac's book, given everybody's probably online buying the book. I uh, think the symbolism there was very, very powerful. Okay, the next question. Uh, you stated that to combat racism and oppression, we need to engage in unlearning. How do you recommend we begin as individuals as a college community? Question mark. Can you give an example or case study of what this might specifically look like in, the, in an academic department? Um. Well, I think that there's um, there's individual learning or unlearning, and then there's collective um, learning and unlearning. And and I think that the first um, step uh, with with respect to um, how uh, racism and 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 white supremacy and and other forms of inequity, um, and and I think that it's important to to name and wrestle with all of them, right? Um, that uh, patriarchy is real, you know, classism is real, xenophobia is real, um, uh, homophobia is real. Um, and, and, and so I think that, that what we know in the research um, and what, what I think we know at, at, at our, our best selves is that, um, any form of inequality is odious. And so, but I think oftentimes in this quote unquote unlearning that we get into these um, uh, oppression Olympics and, and it's like, well, who's more oppressed? And well, you know, if it, and so how do we, how do we honor and respect the conversation about white supremacy without ignoring hetero supremacy, right? And, and how does somebody who's really 
uh, wrestling or impacted by, say, um, hetero supremacy, leave space for a focus on white supremacy and not feel like they're being ignored, right? That it's it's all of us or none of us, and um, and that means that you sort of have to be of two minds, right? Like you you have to be able to hold these complex conversations, and I think in order to do that, that that step one is tell the truth. And I think this, this nation for really since its inception um, has been allergic to the truth. And so this is why these things continue to, to plague and toxify our society because we, we won't tell the truth about how we got here. I mean, we are the only industrialized nation in the history of the world to have committed two genocides the genocide against African people and the genocide against Western indigenous people. And yet we still don't teach them as genocides. We still don't tell the truth to our children. So here come our children who go through this whole system of K 13 years, eight hours a day. They show up to us at, at the community college or the university and they still don't have the language to talk in any real meaningful way about white supremacy or about patriarchy or about like any of these things, right? And so I think that's the first step is that we have to commit to telling the truth to our children. And, and we have to be okay with the fact that, and I think this teachers struggle with this, right? Like I struggle with it as a teacher, I definitely struggle with it as a parent. That it's like, well, damn, if I tell them the truth, they're gonna want answers and I don't have answers. And, and I think that, that that's a problem in our profession is that we're not very good at not knowing and being, and being comfortable in the not knowing, right? So I think that part of the, the unlearning, right, is being able to tell the truth and say, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. And, and one of the things that has kept me teaching for 30 years is how amazing young people are, right? Particularly young people, but I think learners generally, right? At being, at, at not knowing and being okay with that. And I, 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 there's something about young people that just makes me eminently hopeful, even under conditions where I have every reason to not be particularly hopeful because they show up anyway. You know, like, like when we, we at San Francisco State, we went back to in-person teaching in the fall and it was optional for us, right? And, and I was like, man, I am going back to in-person teaching because Zoom was killing me. And those students that came to, to my class the past fall, it was so beautiful to me to see um, how badly they wanted to be back in the classroom, how badly they wanted to learn. And that makes me really hopeful that if we start asking better questions, if we start being more honest in what it is that we present to students, that they'll not only be okay with it, they'll be better for it. And then by extension, we'll be better for it. So I think that truth telling has to happen, like we have to model that with each other. Otherwise it's not gonna, it's not gonna leave the department meeting and get into the classroom if we're not doing that with each other. And I think that that back to your point, David, about like, that means that leadership has to model that. Right, like it has to be clear that this is a place where it is safe to love unconditionally. This is the place where it is safe to show up wounded. Like I don't have to bury or hide, right? What's going on, and and not and, and we don't have to leave this meeting with answers, right? We have to leave this meeting with a, with with a, a, an agreement that we are going to tell each other the truth, and be humble and caring enough 
to be able to listen to that and not have to answer it. So a couple ways in which I've heard this described. Um, so, so first, I guess, a, 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 a resource, right? A good um, place to start the conversation. There's um, a, a book called The Sum of Us, which I, I have found is, is the um, single best uh, book I've read that really examines why we're in this situation and why it is so hard for us in this society to tell the truth and really wrestle and grapple with the various forms of inequality. And one of the points that, that, that she makes in the book um, is that we've created this logic of, of a zero sum game, right? That if, if, um, if we deal with white supremacy, that this will somehow uh, injure or reduce the value of white people, right? If we deal with patriarchy, right? This will somehow reduce or devalue men, et cetera, right? Continue that list. And, and she says, it's that zero, there's, you can, tra you can historically trace the zero sum logic that that is what is really interruptive of our ability to tell the truth because we're so scared if we tell the truth about the ways in which we've benefited from inequality that will somehow be worth less and that will somehow be less happy. And the, 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 the argument in that book is that is that statement I said earlier that no, actually, that that logic, that mathematics, that calculus is actually tearing us apart. And that is why if you look at our public health data as a nation, that we, we have some of the worst health outcomes in the world. And I don't mean for industrialized nations. I mean, period. <laughs> we have some of the, which, is crazy when you think about the fact that we spend some estimates 100x as much on healthcare as any other nation. And part of the reason for that is, is because we're so sick. Like we're, we're a really, we're not a well nation. And there's something called the Global Peace Index, which I encourage y'all to, to, to look up as a, as a good, like, conversation starter, right? For, well, what are, we, what are we striving for? The Global Peace Index is the, the, the global gold standard for measuring peace, wellness, and sustainability in 99.8 of the world's population, okay? It's, it's endorsed by the, the UNESCO, it's endorsed by the World Health Organization, uh, it, it's endorsed by the United Nations. Like it's, it's widely used as the global gold standard. And the United States, I, I, I haven't seen 2022, but 2021, I think we were like 126th in the world on that, on the gold standard of peace, right? So, but it's often hard for people in our positions to wrap our heads around that because we don't live at 126, right? Many of the people on this call, right? Not all of us, but, but many of the people on this call live somewhere in the 20s, right? We have relative stability, we have relative safety. We have, even in times of like pandemic, like we still like super hard, super challenging relatively, right? To, I mean, some people like really, really like, well, they lost their lives, right? They lost their homes, they lost it, right? But most of the people, right, in professional environments aren't living at 126, right? You're living at whatever, 20, 25, right? David, you and I are probably higher up on that than, right, some of the other folks on this call. But the important point for me here as, a, as an educator, right, and as a leader, is that if I'm at let's say 18 on that scale. And the national average is 126. 
What is that? Where does that mean my students are? That, it means they're below 126. So I have to think as an educator about what it means to craft educational spaces that are responsive to 130. And I think most of us craft our educational spaces. Most of us craft our leadership around our own worldview. So there's this brother named Brian Stevenson, who some of you may be familiar with because they, they made a movie about his work. Um, he, he's, he's arguably the most um, successful death row lawyer in the United States. Um, it's Brian with the Y and Stevenson with a V. Um, and so, He, he makes this point that I think is, is how I'd like to tie up my response here. That he says the, 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 the challenge with the unlearning, the challenge with, which is sort of like code for like what it means for us to really commit to justice, what it means for us to really commit to democracy, what it means for us to really commit to freedom, right? To, to, to do that, right? To do that unlearning, to invest in our, in, in our better angels. He says that there's a lot of people in this country that are really working at that. I mean, really, really hard and really, really smart people. Many of those people on this call. And he says, that's not the problem. The problem isn't that we're not working hard enough. He says, the problem is that so many of us that are working on this, are working on it from our boardrooms, from our offices. And we're trying to resolve this suffering, this woundedness that people are feeling. And so, and we're fully committed to it. And so we come up with all these amazing strategic plans and you know, equity plans and like commitments and classroom plans and all this stuff, right? And he says, what, what that is effectively is aspirin. He says, because you see, the thing about aspirin is, is that you hand out aspirin and aspirin temporarily relieves the symptoms of the headache, but it doesn't stop you from getting headaches because aspirin does not address root cause. And he says, the, you cannot address root cause from your office. You cannot address root cause from your boardroom. The only way to address root cause is to get proximity to pain. So as an educator, as a leader, right? I want to, uh, to before I start thinking about what I'm gonna do, right? I wanna get proximity to the pain I'm actually trying to resolve. And in doing that, we have to humble ourselves and say that I don't know 126. I don't know 132. The only people that know 126 and 132 are the people that live at 126 and 132. So I have to go in humbly listening and trusting and believing that they actually have the answers. They actually know what medicine they need. And my job as an educator, my job as a leader is to listen and then figure out how I can make that happen in the space that I'm holding for them. That's what it means to me to be community responsive, right? Is to embed myself as an ethnographer in the community that I serve. The best educators I've ever been around are first and foremost ethnographers of the communities they serve. They really spend time trying to know their students inside of their students' communities. And then they design and craft and develop right, lessons and pedagogy and curriculum that actually reflect the students that they're serving. And you can't do that without telling the truth. You can't do that without really staring down what it means to come to your classroom, to come to your institution every day, living at 126. Right. And so things like I heard y'all saying, like, no tuition this year, no parking, you know, like that, those kinds of redirection of resources 
for, for students' basic needs um, is life altering, right? And it, those are the kind of things that actually then allow them to release the heart space, right? And, and, and open up the head space. I'll give you one more example. For a while, I don't know if they still do this, but UCLA, um, UCLA had like all these students who were going hungry. And it was, it was basically just from talking to students, right? Like their counseling department just was talking to students about like, what do y'all need? Right, and, and they, hunger kept coming up. And so UCLA started a, a pantry, right? A food pantry, so like all over the campus, no questions asked. So you, don't ha you didn't have to be food insecure to come get the, right? And student satisfaction shot through the roof, right? Because like, how can you learn if you're hungry? How can, you can't, you, you biologically, like you, you literally can't study, right? If you're hungry. And so rather than investing in like study spaces and, you know, quiet library spaces or, you know, more like textbooks or whatever, they actually got proximate to the student pain, right? And they said, how do we solve this? And the students were like, just give us food, <laughs> like give us free food. And the school was like, okay. So they just reorganized their resources and studying got easier, right? Research got easier. So I, I think for me, right, that um, there has to be the commitment to truth telling about what has gotten us here, right? What is our national history, right? What is the history of your college? And owning that, not feeling like you have to solve it, just owning it and knowing it, right? And then getting proximity to the most wounded, the most vulnerable students you have to allow them to guide your hand on, on, on what kind of things need to change. Wow, so much rich, richness, Jeff, in your response. We could spend an afternoon on a variety of those topics in and of themselves. We're reminded uh, by one of our librarians that we do have all this, the some of us is in our library of resources. So I encourage folks to look at that. Okay, uh, I think this is next one is one of my favorite questions. Uh, and it says, in one of your articles, you write that hurt people tend to hurt people and people who are well tend to heal, heal people. So, and people who are well tend to heal people. Uh, given we're in this pandemic, what practices do you re recommend at the college and individual levels uh, to moving us toward healing? Uh, this could apply to all employees. And of course we have faculty classified professionals management uh, as we really are focused on creating a community of care. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess my response to that question is probably not all that different from all that different from my response to the, the previous question in that I think um, first, I think it, a lot of the work that that um, that myself and 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 um, scholars that I've been working with now for for a long, long time have been focusing on is um, this idea of, of, of wellness, right? And understanding that, um, that there's, there's multiple layers, right, to wellness. So we talk about it as having three domains. So I think that um, if you're gonna create a community of wellness that, that from, from our worldview, you, you have to be attentive to all three domains. And I think that oftentimes in the academy, um, that our tendency is to like compartmentalize the, things, right? And so I, I also want to state very clearly that I don't see wellness as, um, as something that you can compartmentalize. And th that's why I make that statement that hurt people hurt people and healed people heal people, right? Um, because uh, we, don't, we don't live, work, play in isolation of one another. You know, we, we're not in a cave, right? So if anybody on your faculty or staff is showing up wounded, then, then you're all wounded to some degree. Um, and the same is true that if somebody shows up wounded, right, and that, that community that you're building um, is medicinal, like it, it's, right, it, it, it creates a healing space that everybody's healed, right? Because th that has to cut both ways. And I think we, we tend to say things like hurt people hurt people. 
And then that kind of wants you, makes you want to avoid hurt people. Because like, who wants to be hurt, right? But you can't. You can't avoid hurt people. Because you're a human being. And you live in a society. And so I think it's important to add the second part. Right? Because it incentivizes how we respond to hurt people. Healed people heal people. So if a hurt person shows up, it's actually an opportunity for you to heal. And there's no duck and dodging or denying it. Like the woundedness is going to show, particularly in these days and times, the woundedness is going to show up. So the strategy has to be not how do we avoid the woundedness. The strategy has to be how do we see it more clearly? How do we lean into it more aggressively? And how do we create the conditions of healing? Okay, now for me, the, the, the three domains around healing, it's not just for me, like a, a group of us have been working on this for a while now. Um, and and we, we wrote about it in, in one of the papers that I shared with you um, about, that was from uh, TC record, uh, Teachers College record um, about uh, ethnic studies. And um, in it, we, 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 we talk about the three domains um, of, of wellness, Allison and I do. Um, and um, so the, the, the first domain of wellness um, is, is interpersonal, or excuse me, uh, inner self, right? So all of us are responsible for paying attention to our own well-being. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, it, hurt people hurt people. So if you're hurting, right, you're much more likely to be doing harm. And so if you know you're hurting, um, part of your responsibility to yourself, to your ancestors, to your family, and to your community um, is to do the healing, right, to be honest with yourself. Um, and again, back to what I said in the, in the opening, but to, to give grace to yourself, that that just makes you human, that's all, right? And don't, don't dodge your humanity, right? Own the fact that, that you're hurting and begin to do the, the healing work. Um, so the second uh, domain is the interpersonal. So if you're, if you're working on your inner self, right? If you're working on loving yourself, um, then your interactions with other people, your interpersonal wellness is going to improve, right? Um, and the third uh, domain is interconnectedness. So this is our relationship to things like the land, um, the environment, uh, to our ancestors, um, and to animals, right? Um, so our relationship with the living world, right? And the ancestral world. So we talk about those as like distinctive because it's easier to talk about them in that way. But in, in my own head, like I can't, I can't really disentangle them in, this, in that way, right? Because it's really hard for me to think about my inner wellness without thinking about my sons, right? or thinking about my partner or thinking about my mother, right? So um, interpersonal always sort of like creeps into the inner self, right? And then I can't think about those things without thinking about the fact that I just saw a tsunami warning because like, you know, there was a volcanic eruption. It's like, oh, I have this whole relationship with the environment, right? That I, that also, impacts my, my wellness and my, so I have to be conscious about that, I have to be thinking about that. How do I create, right, classroom spaces and institutional spaces that acknowledge that, like that you, you got to have green space, like you got to have trees, you got to, like those things are important, right, to our, our inner well-being and our interpersonal well-being. So, um, I think that, that, you know, I don't mean to get like postmodern here, right? But it's like, um, I, I don't see anything that we can do in our lives that has a bigger return on investment than an investment in well-being. That if, if we are paying attention to 
to all three of those things. And if we are developing educational spaces that center and foundationalize those things, right? Not as tangential, not as, well, we go over here, this is our wellness center. No, like everywhere is a wellness center or nowhere is a wellness center, right? And I think that way we've often talked about wellness in the society is that it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's an action, right? Instead of a, a way of being. And I think that, that's where you're gonna really create an environment that, that first can acknowledge and see pain. And I think that we've built in, in schools, you know, Peter McLaren said once that schools are a social mirror. So whatever you get in the broader society tends to be what you get in school. So if you get treated poorly in the broader society, you get, tend to get treated poorly in school. If you get treated well in broader society, you tend to get treated well in schools. And I think that, that schools reflect our, a, a national lack of commitment to wellness. And they do that by really emphasizing, caring about, measuring um, technical and mechanical things, grades, degrees, right? And all of which matter, like I'd be a total hypocrite sitting here with a PhD from Berkeley saying that that, that, that doesn't matter, okay? But I think it's gotten out of place. Right? I, I think that we, we've lost track of the capacity of educational spaces to create a, a regional, a local, and a national commitment to saying that the single most important thing for our democracy is the well-being of its people. Punto. And, and we can have all these astrophysicists and you know, nuclear scientists and literary geniuses, but if we're not well, who cares? Every empire in the history of the world is fallen, everyone. And if you study empires, which the US is one, right? If you study empires, the, the, the really interesting thing is, is that they've every single one in the history of the world has fallen for the same reasons, everyone. There is like no outlier. The pattern repeats over and over and over again. And it's always hubris. It's always a lack of willingness to tell the truth, to look ourselves in the mirror and saying, you know what? We're, we're not prioritizing the right things right now. And pump the brakes, right? Clear the plate and start with saying, what, what, what actually is the most important thing? And if it's well-being, right? If it's that we're well, then everything else off the side, right? Let's talk about what it means. What does it mean for your college to say that we are a center of wellness? We don't have a wellness center. We are a center of wellness. And then what does that mean for the community? computer science department, right? What does that mean for the leadership? What does that mean for counseling, right? How does, how is everything that we're doing bringing us back to our foundational core? And, and the crazy thing is, if you really look at the research about educational spaces that do that, they're the most accelerated because they're well, and, and they know like, this is why I'm studying this. I'm not studying this to get a better job or to get, you know, three letters after my name. And yeah, I'm like, I'm, I will get all that too, sure. But I'm studying this because at my core, it makes me more well. And so the way that we've been talking about it is that, and, and I think this is, this, you know, could be a college initiative, doesn't even need to be like everybody on your staff could do this, right, as their own individual project. And, and, and the project is as follows, for what? Like you show up to that gig every day for what? Like leave all, like really for what? And then whatever changes you're gonna make this semester, let that be what drives your change. And, and I think that we need, local, regional, and a national conversation about 
repurposing schools. To say that people at students that come to us will be more well when they leave than when they came. And that's our commitment. And we'll get it wrong. We'll miss the mark all the time. And, and when we do, we'll own it, right? We won't duck it. We won't dodge it. We won't deny it. We will own the fact that in that moment, as practitioners or as an institution, that we didn't live up to that goal to say that, that when you come here to this college, you will leave more well for your time with us. And to me, like that is rigor. And I think the place where you get pushback around these conversations is, but, but what about academic rigor? And I think as long as we talk about those things as if they are distinctive, quote unquote, academic rigor and social justice, we'll do neither. There is no academic rigor without social justice. And there is no social justice without academic rigor, right? We have to do both. We can do both. But in order to do that, we need to stop talking about them as if they're somehow separate projects. You know, you, you talk about wellness, and it occurs to me, and now more than ever post-pandemic, a focus on wellness is going to be critical. And, and how we do that, how we do everything we do may look very different than it did before. But I, I think that's, that's terrific. Uh, Jeff, I want to check in. Um, we're, we're at about an hour. We've got time. Uh, but are you, you good for a couple more questions or where would, what would you like to do? Yeah, sure. And we could even start um, jumping on some of the questions that are coming in in the chat. Either way is fine. Okay. Um, is there somebody that can pull some questions? I was just going to ask, the next question I was going to ask you actually had to do with the rigor and the standards. And let me read the question just to see if there's any more you would add to it. Uh, academic rigor, rigor and standards are sometimes used as a reason to resist dealing with issues of equity or adopting culturally relevant curriculum. Uh, what strategies can you share about how to address these concerns? I just, since you brought it up, I thought there might be some more you might wanted to add there. Yeah, I, I, I would agree fully <laughs> that, um, but, but I think that goes back to the purposing. You know, it's like they're, it's smoke and mirrors to, to say that like, we don't, we don't want to, we don't re really want to examine the, the purpose that we're here. And, and if the purpose is to, um, create like people that can like mechanistically like technocratically um do math science reading writing whatever then carry on <laughs> but if, if if the goal of like a, a you know a, a system of education is to create a pluralistic multiracial democracy we are falling hard on our face and and you know like, again it goes back to like being on like you can't repurpose you can't really ask the, the, the question about for what um, without being honest about what you've been doing. And I think that's hard, right? Because like we didn't sign up to do harm, you know, but we are. <laughs> and so, you know, the first stage to our own healing, right? And it, it is being able to, to, to tell the truth about that. Like, you know what, like we, we got off course. We got off course. And the longer we stay off course, the, the more likely that, that when we do decide to pump the brakes, we're too close to the cliff to stop the fall. And, and you know, if you talk to public health officials, um, th they'll tell you that we're actually in trouble as a nation and pre-pandemic. Because our public health data is so bad, and we're like uh, we're like a, a careening towards this, like it's getting worse and worse and worse. And you know, we were sliding towards being the first industrialized nation to have a declining life expectancy. Meanwhile, like GDP is through the roof, and you know, <laughs> so it's like, what, what what do we really want, right? And and if and 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 how are we a democracy <laughs> if if that's the direct, like, how are we actually going to live up to the, the, the rhetoric? Because uh, right now it's just rhetoric, right? And if, if we want to turn, the, and that rhetoric is worth pursuing, but to make rhetoric reality, you have to confront reality, right? And, and, and so 
I think that um, that you know I think rigor is so important, and 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 having standards is so important. But the the way in which we I think we need to interrogate those concepts, right? What, what do we mean when we say that? And um, and and then I think that also means that we have to really rethink measurement. You know, one of my colleagues um, is this woman named Angela Duckworth, who's at Penn. And uh, I, I, Angela and I disagree on a lot of stuff, um, but I respect her a lot. I think she's an incredibly brilliant. Um, and one of the one of the things she says is is that you know in schools in education um, we measure what we treasure. And so if you want to know what an institution treasures, just look at what it's measuring. And so if a school says like, yeah, you know, our student well-being is really important to me, like, I'm like, okay, well, show me, show me your measurement, show me your data, right? And, and, and it's not, it's just an idea, right? Well, but we have this, this wellness center over here and we have like all these student activities and it's like, but you don't measure it. So it doesn't, at the end of the day, students know that, right? They know we measure what matters to us. And if we're going to say that their well-being matters to us, that's got to be on their report card, right? That's got to be something that we are centering our self-evaluation because out of that self-evaluation comes priorities, right? It comes budget expenditures. It comes hiring, right? Everything, right, is driven out of that. So um, I, I, I think that, that I want to talk about rigor and I want to talk about standards. And I want to get underneath that and talk about for what? What is that rigor for? What are those standards for? And that's where I feel like we, we don't do that, right? It, it's as if, if we do these things that I'm talking about right now, it's like somehow people aren't going to learn anymore. You know, when in fact, what we actually know in, in, the research around physiology, around neuroscience, around neurobiology, is that the things that I'm talking about, wellness, well-being, um, healing, what, what we actually know in the science is that um, there is no rigor without those. Like you, 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 you're not registering or holding anything, right? If you're, if you're, uh, neurobiology is under attack. So we're just playing games anyway, right? Under the auspices that schools have been working. And so like, why, are, why would we fundamentally rethink them? Like we have the best school, no, we don't. We don't have the best school system in, in the world, not even close. So if we own, and, and, I, and I think that's what the US just struggles with so much. Like we're so, egomaniacal and so obsessed with being number one and being the best and that we start lying to ourselves you know like we, we can't even look ourselves in the mirror it's like when you you know you've been cheating on that diet or that you know that that new year's commitment you know you don't look so tightly at yourself in the mirror when in, in the morning right and and i think that students know they know that we won't even tell the truth <laughs> about what this is really about. So why would they trust us? Why would they? So then they show up and now they're just going through the motions, right? And they're like, well, I'm here. I'm going to play this game. I'm going to go to college because that's what you do. And I, I don't know. I, I didn't sign up for that. Like, that's, that's not why I got into this gig. And I, I believe at my core that it doesn't have to be that way, um, that we, we can we can become an incredibly, or we can, can be an incredibly advanced technocratic society um, that has its moral compass pointed in the right direction. And I don't feel like we do right now. And, and that's frustrating to me as somebody who works and has worked for so long with so many educators that, that want that and so many young people that want that. And I just feel like there's a, the voices that are driving so many of the decisions that are happening right now are not actually democratic voices. And I wanna, you know, I, wa I wanna call that out because, um, you know, uh, Cornel West said once 
there is no affirmation through negation. Mm. And, and I feel like a lot of what happens around this kind of punditry, right, about our society and schools and, you know, equality and equity and justice, all these things, is that it's, it just becomes this, um, I don't know, who, who can come up with the better critique? And, um, and I think critique is important, right? I think it's part of telling the truth, right, is being critical. But, um, but I think what Cornel West said is right, that, that, okay, like, I'm down for that. Like, I can, I can hear that. But, but what do you suggest? Like, what, what do you actually suggest we do if we're not going to do that? Right? And, and I think that's the affirmation piece, right? That I think we have to negate the things that are sideways of our moral compass. And we have to spend the time, effort, and resource to talk about if not that, then what? And I, I feel like that's the part of the conversation right now that's, that's underdeveloped. Um, and and I, I think that if, if we... Um, that we have enough examples, we have enough, we know enough in the research uh, to be able to, to begin to craft a different vision. And it doesn't, I mean, the other thing I see happen a lot in schools, is it just goes like whole deck, like everybody, this is the new mission and vision and everybody's gonna be on board. And it's like, well, how's that going for us? Like that never works, right? So I think also learning, you know, from Silicon Valley, because, you know, right, right around the corner, like they, they are, that the the culture there toxic as it is in a lot of ways right um is it is a culture of innovation and and they don't go whole deck like they don't take the iphone and then just throw it out and completely redesign it and that now it's like a triangle right that's not what happens right they 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 experiment they test they they learn and 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 you know it's funny, like I've gotten to do a lot of work in Silicon Valley with some of their leaders, and one of the the, the leaders of a, a well-known company there told me once, he said, "Our most valuable commodity is failure." And I was like, "Whoa, that is like the direct opposite from what schools say. Schools." dodge and deny they'll they don't want to talk about failure and silicon silicon valley innovators right see failure as the gasoline for improvement mm -hmm. right and and for that reason when you look at their budget lines they they put a huge chunk of resource mind you they have way more friggin' resources than we do in education but nevertheless right they put a huge chunk of their resor resources into failure. It's called R and D, right? And then the whole goal of R and D is fail, like push, push, fail, fail, and then what they build in underneath it is a structure to learn from it, right? So failure becomes opportunity, and when you use that word in schools, right, you bury your head in the sand because failure means you failed. And we have to reorient our relationship to that, right? No, failure means if we have a climate and culture that knows how to use failure, failure means growth, right? And you don't want to fail company-wide. Like you don't want to fail across the college. That's not how you improve, right? That you start a pilot project, you make a real investment in it, and you wrap that around that investment the learning from the failure, right? And then, and then those are the conversations that start talking about how do you scale, quote unquote, scale that, right? And I think if we had more of that in schools and more honesty about the fact that we are, we are not, we're not measuring what really matters to us, then I think that you, you could have a, there, you could still have the conversation about rigor, you could still have the conversation about standards, but it'd be a very different conversation that actually, transform student experience. Perfect. Measure what you treasure. Right? Fund, what, fund your values. That's the other one I've always heard of as well. Uh, Jeff, you have offered us so much rich, richness this morning. Is by way of closeout, would there some final words you'd like to offer, some final thoughts? I think just, I, I just want to appreciate um, each of you for 
the courage that it takes to do this work. Um, you know, being an educator is, you know, I've been banging on this thing for 30 years. And um, I have, and, and, you know, played a lot of different roles. And, um, you know, I, I often say that in, in, that, in those 30 years, I have uh, never had a perfect year. I have never had a perfect semester. I have never had a perfect marking period. I have never had a perfect month. I have never had a perfect week. I have never had a perfect day. And I have never had a perfect classroom. But I wake up every day expecting to, knowing that I won't. And it takes a lot of courage to um, keep banging on your craft knowing that, um, that it's not gonna be perfect, but trusting that um, if you are in your sacred purpose, then, um, then that pursuit of perfection is perfect. And in these times, when suddenly, <laughs> I don't know what it is about this society, that lays at the feet of educators every major social problem and then asks us to fix it. I, I don't, I, I probably will never be able to wrap my head fully around that. Um, but I, I embrace what it means to be part of that journey with, with other people. And so I, I'm grateful that, you, that so many of you took the time to, to read some of my ideas about that and to actually engage with them um, to wrestle with them, um, and then to spend all this time today, you know, listening to me ramble on. And um, I, I, so I, I, I want, I guess I want to end by expressing my gratitude for, for that, for you sharing your time, um, and for, for the work that you're going to do uh, this upcoming semester. And just to encourage you that if there's anything that I shared here today, um, that, that, you found useful or that you want to you know learn more about please please don't hesitate to reach out i return every email i get um i'll, I'll drop my email in the chat i think that just went to host and pen oh there we go to, to everyone let me go one more time um and you know if, if there's like references i dropped or um that, that you didn't catch or you want want you know more of it, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. If I do not respond to you, um, it it literally means that my son's deleted your email. <laughs> and anybody who has like school age kids knows that this is a thing, right? In in pandemic when they are at home, uh, so literally if if I don't email you back, I am not ignoring you. I am not too busy. I will make time. Just email me again. You're not bothering me. You're not. You're not annoying me. It 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 has hap literally happened that I found it deleted, and you know I don't want to point my finger at any particular child, but um, I'll just tell you it's one of the two behind me. So please do reach out and and thank you again, David, for and 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 all of you for for having me and spending some time with me. I wish you all the best this year. Please, 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 please take good care of yourselves and be well. Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade from Our Hearts to Yours, thank you for being with us this morning. One of the downsides of webinars, you can't hear that thunderous applause that's happening right now or see those people that are standing for you, but I know that it's happening. I would invite everybody to express your appreciation, a word of gratitude or something in the chat so uh, he can see, I can see it happening right now. So thank you very much, Jeff, it was a pleasure. And I look forward to working with you at some point again soon. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to Beth Patel who is our wonderful coordinator of um, all of this greatness we've had going on today and this week. So Beth. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, uh, Jeff. You know, what an amazing time. I feel so humbled to have heard this and um, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed as I'm trying to process all these ideas and where we go here. And so um, I just think part of this is kind of that uh, realizing kind of where we are, kind of being vulnerable to one another to be honest about where we are and kind of see where we're gonna go ahead from here. Um, 
First off, just a quick thank you to everyone who has uh, participated in our Flex sessions this week and for all of our amazing presenters that have worked hard over the holidays to prepare uh, great activities for us. Those will continue this afternoon. Uh, right after this at 11 o'clock, we will be doing our post-convocation debrief led by T and Sadiqa and Patty. I've posted a link for that in the chat and I'll post another one of that. But let's go ahead and have a time to kind of think about some of these things and talk about what does this mean in our practice as we're trying to promote that educational environment of hope, equity, and fairness that we all want to have. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, then later on this afternoon, we'll have our uh, department meetings at 1245 and the new PM meeting at uh, three o'clock. And Dr. Duncan Andretti, I also say that you had a very nice uh, shout out from one of our uh, employees who remembered you having you as a teacher in 1997 at UC Berkeley and still recalling about what an impact that you had uh, on this person's life. So just thank you for the ways that you're passing down. And as you said, passing down this generation, the next and next and seven generations down our uh, actions and our uh, words will still have meanings and that's very clear in your life. So thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. And thanks to the Special Learning Committee and all the presenters this week. And uh, truly, I think one of our finest uh, finest hours is it was a hour plus. I think it was really tremendous. In closing, I just want to acknowledge folks that this last 22 or so months has, has been not much fun. I think we could agree with that. And uh, I just, again, want to express my appreciation for all of that you've done uh, to keep it together, to keep us moving forward. None of us signed up for this, right? We not, none of us signed up for this when we got into this field, right? Um, but I, I'm, I'm starting to see the light at the end and I hope you'll stick with us and be patient with each other and, um, and be, you know, just, I, we're gonna get there. I know we're gonna get there and our students are excited to get back as he indicated. You know, I have a student, we've, a young man that works at the UPS store where I get my mail. And he shared with me in uh, the fall that he, he dropped out because he just couldn't, you know, just couldn't deal. And he was so excited to learn in December that we were coming back and, and he's he's excited. And, and so I know there are a lot of other students out there that are, are excited as well to be back with you uh, in person and with all of us. So again, I thank you. I truly appreciate all that you're doing from the bottom of my heart. I love the fact that we've opened up this conversation about being able to talk about our hearts, uh, which you know I'm pretty, that flows pretty easily for me anyway. So uh, again, thanks so much. Let's have a great semester and I'm here. Uh, if you have any needs or comments or otherwise, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. So thanks everybody very much.